Okay, welcome to the laboratory lecture for Chem 118 Experiment 8, uh, which is going to be on the Greenard reaction, and it will cover the topic of atmospheric exclusion. Now, I'm sure that you're all aware already from your lecture course that carbon-carbon bonds are not that easy to make. Uh, and uh, in the early 1900s, if you could come up with a way to do this, it was basically a golden ticket to a Nobel Prize. Now, a carbanion would be a great way to uh, make a new carbon-carbon bond because it would be a strong nucleophile which could easily attack an electrophilic carbon to create the new bond. But the problem here is that the alkane pKa that you're trying to generate this from is 50 to 60. So there really aren't any bases strong enough. So we'd like to make this carbanion, but if we try to make it from a simple alkane, we find that we really can't make an appreciable amount of that carbanion and get the reaction to go. But we have another tool in the arsenal, and that is carbon metal bonds. Because metals tend to have very low electronegativity or very high electropositivity, they tend to create strong dipoles. And the strong dipole created by the presence of a carbon metal bond can approximate the chemistry of a carbanion without having to deal with the insurmountable challenge of deprotonating an alkane to make it. Now we know these magnesium containing reagents as Grignard reagents and they're not that easy to form but they're a lot easier to make than a carbanion would be. And the way that we do this is we take a corresponding alkyl halide such as this methyl bromide and combine it with zero valent magnesium which is just pure metallic magnesium. Now the thing about combining methyl bromide with magnesium in an attempt to create this reagent is that the reagent will only form when it is particularly stabilized by solvent interactions. And so to get this equilibrium pushed in the direction that we want, we're going to have to add a very uh, carefully chosen solvent. And in this case, it turns out that ether solvents are what get the job done. So here my alkyl ether solvents come in and make a stabilizing connection with the Grignard reagent. So this affects my equilibrium in a way that is beneficial to me and allows me to make enough of the Grignard reagent to get this reaction to proceed. Now this generates a new problem. Because we're using ether in our Grignard reaction, we have to be careful that the ether is dry. Because remember, Grignard reagents approximate the behavior of carbanions, which in the presence of water would easily win that acid-base transfer and get the proton to become the corresponding alkane. So if I have wet ether, that is ether that is saturated with water, I can expect to deactivate a portion or all of my Grignard reagent simply because I wasn't careful enough to dry my ether. So this table here shows some of the water solubilities of, uh, of these solvents and the solubility of water in these solvents. So even solvents we tend to think of as being completely anhydrous like diethyl ether methylene chloride and chloroform do in fact contain a small amount of water and sometimes it's enough to do some damage. So we know now that at equilibrium with atmospheric moisture there's at least a little bit of water trapped in ether even though we tend to think of it as being a completely organic solvent. But is it really enough water to cause significant damage to our reaction? Well, in order to figure this out, we're going to calculate the amount of water in saturated wet ether. So the literature tells us this is about 1.5 grams water per 100 mL ether, or about 1.5%. So to determine how much water that really is on a molarity basis, I'm going to place 1.5 grams water per 100 mL ether, divide by the molar mass of water, and then a conversion factor to get me into molarity. So my unit analysis tells me that this calculation will give me the molarity of water in wet ether. And my estimate is about 0.83 molar water. Now that's a significant amount, and that's enough to cause some issues with Grignard reactions. So we're going to have to do something about this before we try to run our reaction. One thing that we can do, we've already learned, is to use anhydrous magnesium sulfate as a means of drying organic solvents. And this is usually fairly effective, but there's actually an even more effective technique using a material called molecular sieves. 
Now, molecular sieves are inorganic material which contain extremely ordered, extremely uniform, extremely small um, pores. And those pores are about three to five angstroms in diameter. So they're just barely big enough for a water molecule to fit inside, but they're small enough that larger solvent molecules like diethyl ether can't get inside. So what this means is that from the perspective of a water molecule, there's a tremendous amount of surface area with which it can interact in the molecular sieve. Whereas the ether molecule simply can't fit inside, so it can only come into contact with the sieve at its surface. Now the consequence of this is that, naturally, the water can get trapped inside of the sieves, while the ether cannot. So how do we use sieves in the lab and this property of their very regular ordered porosity to get the water away from the ether? Well the answer is actually quite simple. Here I have a beaker with wet ether. I'm going to add to that some three angstrom molecular sieves. Now those molecular sieves, recall, can only absorb appreciably the water molecules from that wet ether. So if I wait long enough, I expect that most or all of the water in the sample will be absorbed into that molecular sieve, whereas the ether will not. At this point, the water is now trapped inside of solid molecular sieve. The ether is still in the liquid phase in the beaker above it. I can simply remove one from the other by decanting. So we've dealt with moisture exclusion from solvents, but now we also have to think about the atmosphere as a source of potentially reactive uh, contaminants. The air contains several different compounds which can be problematic. Uh, the most common of which of course would be oxygen at about 22%, which can oxidize organics and act as ligands in certain uh, metal containing uh, compounds. There's also water in the form of moisture, which is variable depending on the, the weather conditions, but uh, just a little bit of it can sometimes do us in. Remember, water is a weak acid with a pKa of about 15.7, so it can participate in a host of acid-base uh, proton transfer reactions, which can really kibosh a synthesis. And there's also nitrogen at 78%, which you may not think of as being reactive, but in some cases, when we're using extremely reactive organometallics, even nitrogen can be a problem. Now, nitrogen will not be a problem for us. In the case of a Grignard reaction, it's not going to be an issue. But our main issue is still water coming in from the atmosphere. So let's look at some ways that we exclude these atmospheric uh, contaminants, if you will, from our reaction. The first technique is the use of something called a drying tube. A drying tube is simply a tube which is attached to an apparatus which is otherwise closed and the tube itself contains desiccant, usually in the form of anhydrous calcium chloride. Now this anhydrous calcium chloride is there to absorb any moisture which tries to traverse the gap between its opening and the reaction mixture. So all other atmospheric gases like N2, O2, and CO2 can make it through our drying tube and into our reaction vessel. But if we have a reaction which is only sensitive to the moisture in the air and no other atmospheric gases, the drying tube offers a very simple and inexpensive way to remove a great deal of the moisture from the atmosphere. We can go one step further and exclude all atmospheric gases if we use a nitrogen purge or an inert gas purge on our system. In this case, we usually direct nitrogen or some other inert gas into the flask through one connection and then out through a second so that the flask's headspace is consistently and constantly purged with the inert gas. The inert gas is then plumbed into what's known as an oil bubbler where the gas progresses down the interior stem and is bubbled out through the mineral oil. And the mineral oil acts as a sort of an airlock preventing any atmospheric gases from diffusing back into the tube and ultimately into the reaction mixture. The next apparatus I'd like to tell you about is something known as a Schlenk line. Now a Schlenk line is an extremely effective technique for excluding all atmospheric gases 
And the apparatus is a little bit more complex than our gas purge apparatus was, but it also is, gives us much greater control over the contents of a particular flask's headspace. It consists of two different lines, an inert gas line and a vacuum line, each of which can be placed in line with a hose barb through the use of a three-way stopcock. In this schematic we can see how the three-way stopcock operates. By turning it 90 degrees from the open position on the left, we get a closed position where neither one of our two lines is in line with our flask. By continuing the rotation to a full 180 degrees, I've opened the alternative line. So in this case, on the left I have it open to the inert gas line, in the middle I have closed, and on the right I have it open to the vacuum line. So why would I want to create a system like this where I can put my flask in line with inert gas and then vacuum again and again back and forth? Well, let's take a look at what happens when I do that. So here again is our schematic of a Schlenk line. I'm going to zoom in now on the round bottom flask so we can see what's going on inside as we operate the Schlenk line. I'm going to begin the experiment with the stopcock closed. Now the atmosphere inside is going to consist of whatever the atmosphere was when I first closed the system, which presumably is the atmosphere. And that contains a lot of reactive gas, which I'll depict using blue. I'm going to use a red sp a sphere to indicate the inert gas. So what I'll do here is charge my flask with our reactive gas. Then I'll open the stopcock to the vacuum line, removing some or all the reactive gases. I then turn my stopcock back to the inert gas line, refilling my flask with the inert gas, and then closing the stopcock. Now you can see the clear consequence of this. My flask contains much more of the inert gas and much less of the reactive atmospheric gas than it did at the start of my experiment. If I repeat this process several times, each time I evacuate the flask, I remove more and more of the reactive gas inside and I charge the flask with more and more of the inert gas from the inert gas line. So after several iterations of this, I have an atmosphere within my flask which is essentially completely inert. I can now continue with my process, run my reaction. The fourth and final technique for atmospheric exclusion that we'll discuss is the use of an atmospheric glove box. Glove boxes are extremely effective at the exclusion of all atmospheric gases, up to and including nitrogen. So we can choose whatever atmosphere we like to pump inside of this box. It's maintained under positive pressure so that any small leaks within the box result in the inert gas flowing out rather than reactive gas flowing in. Clearly you can see this because the gloves in the chamber are inflated outward rather than inward. The major benefit to using a glove box apparatus is that we can put almost anything that we can imagine inside and work within the box as though it were the bench top. So rather than confining ourselves to Schlenk lines where transfer of reagents is very complex, very difficult, in the case of glove boxes, we can weigh things on balances, pour them from beakers uh, and out from bottles as though we were working on the bench top. We introduce these large objects into the glove box using a vacuum and a chamber into which we place the objects and then pump them down to a vacuum and refill with inert gas several times, just like an airlock, before opening the chamber from the opposite side and bringing the items in. So this week we're going to conduct our reaction attempting to exclude atmospheric moisture and moisture from the ether solvents that we're using. So we're going to have to be sure that our system is fairly well closed to that atmosphere. Of course, we'll be using a drying tube, which means that pressure within our flask will be equilibrated with that of the air outside. But what about the funnels that we're using to add our reagents in a slow, dropwise, controlled fashion? See, the problem here is we've used our separatory funnels in the past to do this kind of technique, to slowly and carefully add one reagent to another in a dropwise formation. But the problem is that if we do this with the cap in place to help exclude the atmosphere, that stopper is going to create of a space above the liquid, which of course will have a drop in pressure as soon as that liquid begins to flow out of the funnel. So we need to come up with a way to maintain similar pressures within the headspace of the funnel that we're using for addition, 
and also that of the reaction flask. This is why we use a device called an addition funnel. The addition funnel is a lot like our separatory funnels with the exception that the headspace of that funnel is connected through a thin glass stem to the headspace of our reaction mixture. Now this stem and the pressure equalization that it provides allows the liquid to flow completely and in a very controlled way out of the addition funnel and into the reaction flask. The stems are very delicate which is why we don't put these into your kits. In fact your TA will have a collection of them at the TA lab bench and we'll be distributing them to you and then collecting them from you again at the end of the day. So remember these stems are only to allow gases to move through to equilibrate in the headspace of the addition funnel. They're not for clamping, they're not for carrying, they're not for any other purpose and they should be treated very cautiously because breaking them can be a very expensive proposition. So here's the procedure for the week. This week we're going to produce a tertiary alcohol by reacting a Grignard reagent with a ketone. We'll be doing this under anhydrous conditions by using dried diethyl ether using molecular sieves and also by excluding atmospheric moisture using a drying tube. When we're done we're going to quench the reaction with dilute sulfuric acid and purify the product by extraction. Having made a tertiary alcohol from a ketone, it should be very easy to tell whether we've been successful using FTI or spectroscopy. And then finally, we'll do a little bit more product analysis using proton NMR spectroscopy to ensure that we've created the T-butyl alcohol that we believe we have. And finally, we'll clean up the laboratory. Because this is a Grignard reaction, naturally there will be bromine involved. Now remember that our starting material is an alkyl halide and even though ultimately the product we create is an inorganic halide, we have to consider the possibility that some of our starting material has not reacted. Therefore any solutions which may be contaminated with unreacted starting material should be placed in a halogenated organic waste container. Any liquids containing ether or the final product can be placed into the non-halogenated waste container and any aqueous acid solutions uh, if they need to be, uh, can be acidified with 6 molar HCl, but uh, most of them will be acidic already and they'll be placed into the acidic aqueous waste container. Uh, standard rules are going to apply for solids and broken glass.